Hello, and welcome to this online lecture. Today, we're going to be covering Chapter 1, which is about data collection, from your Math 200 online class at Ivy Tech. So we're going to start with Section 1.1, which is the Introduction to the Practice of Statistics. So this chapter, it's not going to seem very math-y to you, okay? I'm not going to really deal with numbers too much or do many calculations, um, but we are going to look at what statistics is, and some of the terminology that you need to be familiar with. So statistics is the science of collecting, organizing, summarizing, and analyzing information to draw conclusions or answer questions. In addition, statistics is about providing a measure of confidence in any conclusions. The information that's referred to in the definition is called data. Data are just facts or um, propositions used to draw a conclusion or make a decision. It describes the characteristics of an individual. A key aspect of data is that they vary. So if you're thinking about, um, let's say we're talking about heights in a classroom, you could ask yourself, is everyone in your class the same height? And obviously no would be the answer. Does everyone have the same hair color? No. So among individuals, there is variability. And in fact, data vary when measured on ourselves as well. So you could ask questions like, do you, um, how many hours do you sleep each night? And depending on the time at which you ask a person, they might answer differently. Or how many calories do you consume each day? That probably varies day to day. So one goal of statistics is to describe and understand the sources of variability. So being able to actually quantify that. Okay, so the entire group of individuals to be studied is called the population. You can see there's kind of a graphical de depiction up here. An individual is just a person or a member, or sorry, a person or an object that is a member of the population. So any one of these individuals. And then a sample is a subset of the population that's being studied. We're going to talk about different types of sampling, uh, but you can see that all of the people that are in the sample are also in the population. Descriptive statistics consists of organizing and summarizing data. Um, descriptive statistics describe data through numerical summaries, tables, and graphs. A statistic is just a numerical summary based on a sample. Inferential statistics uses methods that take results from a sample and extends them back to the population and measures the reliability of the result. Now, a parameter is a numerical summary of a population. So if we go back for a minute, a statistic is a numerical summary of a sample. A parameter is a numerical summary of a population. These should be pretty easy to remember because um, parameter and population both start with P and statistic and sample both start with S. So let's go through a couple of examples. So we want to identify whether these are parameters or statistics and why. So let's suppose that the percentage of all students on your campus who have a job is 84.9%. So we want to know if that 84.9% is a parameter or a statistic. So this one, it's going to be a parameter since it's from the population. So it doesn't make any mention of um, sampling people from your campus. It's saying that that is the actual percentage. So that means that all students on your campus were surveyed and 84.9% was the number that was arrived at. Now let's look at this next one. Suppose a sample of 250 students is obtained and from this sample we find that 86.4% have a job. Now this one, it specifically says that we took a sample of students, so that means it's from a sample, so that's going to be a statistic. Okay, now the process of statistics um, consists of kind of four main steps. The first step that you always want to take is to identify the research objective. So a researcher has to determine the question or questions that he or she wants to answer before you do anything else. It has to be detailed so that it identifies the population that's to be studied and the questions that we're answering. The second step is to actually collect the data that's needed to answer the question above. So gaining access to an entire population is oftentimes very difficult and very expensive. So when conducting research, we typically look at samples. 
The collection of data step is vital to the statistical process because if the data isn't collected correctly, the conclusions that you draw are meaningless. So we're going to talk about some things like bias and some um, good ways of sampling that allow us to get the data that we actually want. Um, the third step is going to be to describe the data. So obtaining descriptive statistics allows the researcher to obtain an overview of the data and you can provide insight as to the type of statistical methods the researcher should use. So we discuss this step in detail in chapters two through four. And then step four is to perform inference. So we apply the appropriate techniques to extend the results obtained from a sample to the population and report a level of reliability in the results. We are going to discuss the techniques for measuring reliability in chapters five through eight, and then inferential techniques in chapters nine. This says nine through 15, but it's nine through 12. Okay, so illustrating the process of statistics, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this example and talk through the process of statistics in terms of this scenario here. So many studies evaluate batterer treatment programs, but there aren't very many experiments designed to compare batterer treatment programs to non-therapeutic treatments like community service. So researchers designed an experiment in which 376 male criminal court defendants who were accused of assaulting their intimate female partners were randomly assigned into either a treatment group or a control group. The subjects in the treatment group entered a 40-hour batterer treatment program, and the subjects in the control group received what is typical, which would be 40 hours of community service. So they're both 40 hours, but the control is getting community service, which is a pretty typical sentence, and the treatment group is getting a 40-hour batterer treatment program. After six months, it was reported that 21% of the males in the control group, so those are the ones who did community service, had further battering incidents, but only 10% of the males in the treatment group, which was the batterer treatment program, had any further battering incidents. So the researchers did conclude that the treatment was effective in reducing repeat battering offenses. Now, we're going to actually... Um, have the ability at the end of the whole course in order to figure out if that 21% and the 10% are significant. But the researchers have already performed those tests for us and concluded that yes, they were, um, the treatment was effective. So step one, identify the research objectives. So in this case, the research objective is to determine whether males accused of battering their intimate female partners that were assigned to a 40-hour batterer treatment program are less likely to batter again compared to those assigned to 40 hours of community service. So the researchers had it in their mind that this batterer treatment program is more effective than community service, and they set out to design an experiment that would test that. Step two is to collect the information needed to answer the question. So the researchers randomly assigned um, subjects into two groups. Group one participants received the 40-hour batterer program and group two participants received 40 hours of community service. And then six months after the program ended, the percentage of males that battered their intimate female partners was determined again. Step three is to describe the data, organize and summarize the information. So the demographic characteristics of the subjects in the experimental and control groups were very similar. After six months of treatment, 21% of the males in the control group had any further battering incidents, while only 10% of the males in the treatment group had any further battering incidents. Step four is to draw conclusions from the data. So we extend the result of the 376 males in the study to all males who batter their intimate female partner. That is to say that males who batter their female partner and participate in a batter treatment program are less likely to batter again. Okay, um, now we wanna talk about variables. Variables are the characteristics of the individuals within the population. And one key point is that variables vary. So that's why they're called variables. If you consider the variable height, if all individuals had the same height, then obtaining the height of one individual would be sufficient in knowing the heights of all individuals. But of course, this isn't the case. As researchers, we wish to identify the factors that influence the variability. 
Now we have two different types of variables. Um, we have qualitative variables or categorical variables. Um, categorical variables can also be called quantitative variables. Or sorry, um, qualitative variables can be called categorical variables. And um, we also have quantitative variables, which provide numerical measures of individuals. So arithmetic operations, such as addition, subtraction, um, can be performed on the values of a quantitative variable and provide meaningful results. Okay, that's a key. So it doesn't mean that it's just a number. It means that when you add or subtract, it can provide some kind of meaningful result. A qualitative variable or categorical variable just classifies individuals based on some characteristic. So let's look at some examples here. So if we're talking about nationality, that one is not going to be a number, okay? So it's qualitative. Number of children, though, that's definitely numeric, and it would make sense to add or subtract those numbers, so that's quantitative. Household income, same thing. It's definitely numeric, and it does make sense to add or subtract those values. Level of education, when we're talking about this, typically we're talking about um, levels like less than high school, high school, some college, college, uh, master's, and then maybe a PhD. So that would be a qualitative measure. Daily intake of whole grains measured in grams per day is going to be quantitative. Now zip code is the one that can be a little tricky. This is going to be the same thing for like zip code, social security number, telephone number. So those things are all quantitative in the sense that they're numbers. However, if you think about zip codes, it doesn't really make any sense to add or subtract zip codes, okay? So since it doesn't make any sense to do that, it's qualitative, all right? So just because it's numeric does not mean that's automatically quantitative. It has to make sense to actually add or subtract those values. Now, um, we have qualitative variables, we have quantitative variables. Quantitative variables can also be categorized in two additional ways, as either discrete or continuous. Now, a discrete variable is just a quantitative variable that has either a finite number of possible values or a countable number. So it just means you can count. So you could count 0, 1, 2, 3. Continuous is a quantitative variable that has an infinite number of possible values, and it can be measured at any desired level of accuracy. So if you think about these two things, if you think about a number line, discrete is just going to be all those individual points, 0, 1, 2, 3. Continuous is going to be shaded across the entire number line. Okay, so uh, let's look at this. So number of children, if you think about it, you can count the number of children that someone has, zero, one, two, three, and so on. So that's going to be discrete. Number of cars that arrive at a McDonald's drive through between 12 p.m. and 1 p.m., it could vary a lot, but you can still count them. You could sit there and count the number of cars. But if we're talking about the distance traveled by a person in a single day, that's going to be continuous because we could be talking about miles or feet or any number of things, and we could measure it to any desired level of accuracy. The list of observations a variable assumes is called data. While gender is a variable, the observations, male or female, are the data. Qualitative data are just observations that correspond to a qualitative variable, and quantitative data are just observations that correspond to a quantitative variable. Discrete data are observations that correspond to discrete variables, and you can probably guess that continuous data are observations that correspond to a continuous variable. So basically, qualitative, quantitative, discrete, continuous variables are the same thing or they follow the same rules as qualitative, quantitative, discrete, and continuous data. So if you have a qualitative variable, you're going to have qualitative data from that variable. Now, we also have something called level of measurement, okay? So this is an additional way that we can categorize variables. So a variable at the nominal level of measurement um, it means that the variable names or categorizes, but the naming scheme doesn't allow for any ranking or order. Okay, so nominal means no ranking, no order. If you have something at the ordinal level, ordinal should be pretty easy to remember because that corresponds with order. So it has properties of the nominal level of measurement, 
but um, the variables can be ranked in some kind of order. Now, interval level has the properties of ordinal, um, and the differences in the values of the variable have meaning. Now, a value of zero in the interval level does not mean the absence of quantity. Arithmetic operations such as addition and subtraction can be performed on the values. Ratio goes one step further though. It has the same properties as interval, except that the ratios of the values of the variables have meaning. So that means that a value of zero in the ratio level actually means zero, okay? So I like to think of ratio as zero equals zero, and interval as zero is not equal to the absence of quantity. So let's look at some examples. Number of snack and soft drink machines in the vending uh, machines at school. So this one's going to be ratio because if you don't have any vending machines in your school, then that means you have none. So zero is in fact equal to zero. Now, whether or not the school has a closed campus policy during lunch, that's going to be nominal. It's a yes or no question, okay? Now, there's not really a way that we can order that. It doesn't really make sense. So it's either yes or no, no order associated. If we're talking about class rank, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, there's definitely an order associated there. So it's ordinal because it ranks them. And then temperature outside is going to be interval because if you have a temperature of zero outside, it doesn't mean that you don't have a temperature. It means that the temperature is actually zero. It has a meaningful meaning. So interval indicates that zero does not mean that there's an absence of quantity. So it doesn't mean that there's not a temperature. It just means that the temperature is actually zero degrees. Okay, section 1.2 talks about observational studies versus designed experiments. So an observational study measures the value of the response variable without attempting to influence the value of either the response or the explanatory variables. That is to say that in an observational study, the researcher observes the behavior of the individuals in the study without trying to influence the outcome. If a researcher assigns the individuals in a study to a certain group, intentionally changes values of the explanatory variable, and then records the value of the response, the researcher is conducting a designed experiment. So we're going to go through these and decide if they're observational studies or designed experiments. So researchers wanted to determine the long-term benefits of the influenza vaccine on seniors age 65 and over. The researchers looked at records of over 36,000 seniors for 10 years. They were divided into two groups. Group one were the seniors who did choose to get the flu vaccine, and group two were seniors who chose not to. After observing them for 10 years, it was determined that those who get the flu shots are 27% less likely to be hospitalized for pneumonia or the flu, and 48% less likely to die from the pneumonia or the flu. So... Um, this one is going to be an observational study. The answer isn't given on this slide. I didn't realize that. Um, because of the fact that we're just observing what seniors are already doing. We're not dictating whether a senior should or shouldn't get a flu shot. We're just observing what's already happening and then um, making or trying to draw some conclusions from there. But we're not actually designing the experiment. So it says, based on the results of this study, would you recommend that all seniors go out and get a flu shot? No, not really. The study may have some flaws, namely confounding. So confounding in a study occurs when the effects of two or more explanatory variables are not separated. Therefore, any relation that may exist between an explanatory variable and the response variable may be due to some other variable or variables not accounted for in the study. So since it's an observational study, we do run into this issue with confounding. Um, so there are some things that we probably can't really take into account. And that's um, things like socioeconomic status, age, um, overall health status. And one thing to think about with this is that flu shots are voluntary. So the type of person who might get the flu shot might already be the type of person who is more health conscious and already less likely to get sick. So there is some confounding that goes on there. Now, a lurking variable is an explanatory variable that was not considered in the study that, that affect the value of the response variable in the study. And in addition to that, lurking variables are typically related to any explanatory variables considered in the study. So some lurking variables for the flu study would be age, health status, mobility, 
And even after accounting for potential lurking variables, the authors of the study concluded that getting a flu shot is associated with the lower risk of being hospitalized or dying from the flu. Now, it's important to note the word associated. Observational studies do not allow a researcher to claim causation, so we can't say that one thing causes another, but what we can say is that they are associated. Now, there are several types of observational studies. Cross-sectional studies collect information about an individual at a specific point in time or over a very short period of time. Case control studies are considered retrospective, so what they do is they require individuals to look back in time or require the researcher to look back at existing records. In case control studies, individuals who have certain characteristics are matched with those who do not. And then cohort studies first identifies a group of individuals to participate in the study, that's your cohort, and then the cohort is observed over a long period of time. Over this time period, characteristics about the individuals are recorded, and because data is collected over time, the cohort studies are considered prospective. So we want to determine whether the following depicts an observational study or a designed experiment, and um, we want to determine the type of observational study if it is an observational study. So researchers wanted to assess the long-term psychological effects on children evacuated during World War II. They obtained a sample of 169 former evacuees and a control group of 43 people who were children during the war, but were not evacuated. The subject's mental states were evaluated using questionnaires. It was determined that the psychological well-being of the individuals was adversely affected by evacuation. So for this one, this is definitely an observational study because we're not actually dictating who was evacuated and who wasn't because, well, it happened in the past. And then this is going to be case control. Now, if we flip our slide back for a minute, case control studies are the ones that are retrospective. So we ask an individual now about something that happened in the past, which is exactly what's happening here. Okay, xylitol has proven effective in preventing dental cavities when included in food or gum. A total of 75 Peruvian children were given milk with and without xylitol and were asked to evaluate the, test, the taste of each. Overall, the children preferred the milk flavored with xylitol. So this it is a designed experiment because what we're doing is um, we're taking the Peruvian children and we're controlling how they're drinking the milk, okay? And we've designed an experiment to determine um, whether or not the taste is preferred with or without xylitol. We're gonna come back to this experiment in a few minutes and answer even more questions about it. A total of 974 homeless women in the Los Angeles area were surveyed to determine their level of satisfaction with the health care provided by shelter clinics versus the health care provided by government clinics. The women reported greater quality satisfaction with the shelter and outreach clinics compared to the government. So this one is going to be an observational study, so we're just observing what's already happening, and it's cross-sectional because we're just looking at a very short amount of time or really just a snapshot in time. The Cancer Prevention Study 2 is funded, by, funded and conducted by the American Cancer Society. Its goal is to examine the relationship among environmental and lifestyle factors on cancer cases by tracking approximately 1.2 million men and women. Study participants completed an initial study questionnaire in 1982, providing information on a range of lifestyle factors like diet, alcohol and tobacco use, occupation, medical history, and family cancer history. These data have been examined extensively in relation to cancer mortality. Vital status of study participants is updated um, twice each year, or is it every two years? By Bi Biannually is every two years. Um, cause of death has been documented for over 98% of all deaths that have occurred, and mortality follow-up of the CPS2 participants is complete through 2002 and is expected to continue for many years. So this is an observational study because we're just observing the types of, um, basically, whether or not the person gets cancer and trying to relate it back to their diet, alcohol, that sort of thing. 
And this is a cohort study because we're following people over a long period of time. So this started all the way in 1982. And um, this description that gives, that's given here um, is from 2002, but my guess is that it's still going on. Now a census, you've probably heard of this, is a list of all individuals in a population along with certain characteristics of each individual. So taking a census is very, very expensive. In the United States, it's done only every 10 years. The last was done in 2010 um, because of the fact that getting all individuals to respond to something is very, very difficult, very expensive, very time consuming. And we still don't get everyone to respond, but we do our best. All right, we're gonna talk about simple random sampling. So random sampling is the process of using chance to select individuals from a population to be included, included in the sample. Now, if convenience is used to obtain a sample, the results of a survey are meaningless. So we're gonna talk about convenience in a little bit, but that's things like um, having certain readers of a magazine respond to a survey. It's convenient because the readers will respond, but it's not really indicative of what all people think because of the fact that the readers are already um, a very particular segment of the population. A sample of size N from a population of size N, okay, so sample is little n, population is big N, is obtained through simple random sampling if every possible sample of size N has an equally likely chance of occurring. The sample is then called a simple random sample. So in order to obtain a simple random sample, you obtain a frame, which is just a list of all individuals in the population of interest. You would number the individuals in the frame um, from one all the way to N, okay? And then you use either a random number table, graphing calculator, or statistical software to randomly generate um, a little n number of numbers where n is the desired sample size. So this can be done, I think in your homework, you'll be doing this um, with a random number table. And um, the book does walk through an example of this so you can look at that. Okay, section 1.4 goes through some other effective sampling methods. So a stratified sample is one that's obtained by separating the population into homogeneous, non-overlapping groups called strata, and then obtaining a simple random sample from each stratum. The individuals within each should be homogeneous or similar in some way. A systematic sample is obtained by selecting every case individual from a population. So the first individual is selected as a random number between one and K, and then um, you continue to add until you get all of the people that you want. So here are the steps. You just determine the sample size, which is your, or sorry, you determine the population size, which is big N. You determine the sample size, which is little n. You divide those two and you round down to the nearest integer. That's going to be K. You randomly select a number between one and K and you call that number P. Now your sample size is going to consist of the following. So the first person you're going to take is person P. And then for each, um, each person in your sample, you add K each time. So for example, if you start with the fifth person and you want every 10th person, you would take the fifth person and then the 15th person and then the 25th person. And then this formula at the back here will give you the very last person in your sample. So you take your initial number and then you take one less than your sample size and multiply it by K and then add it to your initial number. Now a cluster sample is obtained by selecting all individuals within a randomly selected collection or group of individuals. So here's um, some kind of images that show you what these various types of sampling look like. So for simple random sampling, you can see that it just looks random, okay? So person two, five, and nine were as likely as any other three person group to be chosen. Stratified sampling, it looks like we um, put these into two distinct groups. It looks like they were grouped into males and females. And then within each, there was simple random sampling done. Systematic sampling looks like it started at person two and then every third person was chosen. So we started at person two and then we went up three to choose person five, eight, and 11. Cluster sampling, we took our population, we divided it into clusters, 
And then we took our clusters and we randomly sampled an entire cluster. So for example, we chose this cluster here. So we're sampling one, two, three, and four. And we chose this cluster here. So we're sampling 17, 18, 19, and 20. Now a convenience sample is one in which the individuals in the sample are easily obtained. There's kind of a cautionary note here. Any studies that use this type of sampling generally have results that are suspect. Results should be looked on with extreme skepticism. So anything where you see um, newspaper surveys or um, magazine surveys or someone standing outside the mall and taking a survey, those would be convenient, okay, but they're not very accurate. Now, in practice, most large-scale surveys obtain samples using a combination of the techniques that were just presented, and that's considered multi-stage sampling. So an example of this is Nielsen. You guys have probably heard about Nielsen. They do the TV ratings, okay? So Nielsen randomly selects households and monitors the television programs these households are watching through something called a people meter. The meter is an electronic box that's placed on each TV within the household. The people meter um, measures what program is being watched and who is watching it. Nielsen selects the households with a two-stage sampling process. Stage one is to use the U.S. Census data and divide the country into geographic areas or strata. The strata are typically city blocks and urban areas and geographic regions in rural areas, and about 6,000 of them are randomly selected. And then Nielsen sends representatives to the selected strata and lists the households within the strata. The households are then randomly selected through a simple random sample. So it involves two different stages of sampling in order to end up with all of the people who have a people meter on their TV. So Nielsen then sells the information obtained to television stations and companies, and the results are used to help determine the prices for commercials. Okay, section 1.5 talks about bias in sampling. So if the results of the sample are not representative of the population, then the sample has bias. There are three main sources of bias. There's sampling bias, non-response bias, and response bias. So sampling bias means that the techniques used to obtain the individuals to be in the sample tends to favor one part of the population over another. Undercoverage is a typical type of sampling bias. Undercoverage occurs when the proportion of one segment in the population is lower in a sample than it is in the population. Um, so, for example, if we're talking about um, some kind of survey maybe at a university, if we haven't sampled enough freshmen, then it's not really um, getting kind of a true look at how all individuals in the school see a certain issue. Now, non-response bias exists when an individual selected to be in the sample does not respond to the survey um, and has a different opinion from those who do. So if it tends to be maybe like a touchy subject, um, individuals who have maybe the opinion that isn't as popular might not respond to the survey, okay, or might not be as likely to respond to the survey as individuals who have the popular opinion. Non-response can be improved through the use of callbacks or rewards and incentives, so continually calling people back to get them to respond or possibly um, offering some kind of reward or incentive for responding. Now, response bias exists when the answers on a survey do not reflect the true feelings of the respondent. So there are several types of response bias. First is interviewer error. Second is misrepresented answers. Three is words used in survey questions. So it could be that the question is kind of worded in a not very, um, or in a way that might influence the person's response. And then the ordering of the questions or words within the question. Non-sampling errors are errors that result from sampling bias, non-response bias, response bias, or data entry error. So such errors could also be present in a complete census of the population. Now, sampling errors are errors that result from using a sample to estimate information about a population. This type of error occurs because a sample gives incomplete information. So samples kind of give us the best that we can get, but they're not going to be perfect. So there are errors associated with that. Okay, now let's move on to section 1.6, which is the design of experiments. 
So an experiment is a controlled study conducted to determine the effects of varying one or more explanatory variables or factors um, and what effect that has on the response variable. Any combination of the values of the factors is called a treatment. Now the experimental unit or the subject is a person, object, or some other well-defined item upon which a treatment is applied. A control group is going to serve as a baseline that can be used to compare to other treatments. And a placebo is an innocuous medication such as a sugar tablet that looks, tastes, and smells like the experimental medication. Now, blinding is a really important thing. It refers to the non-disclosure of the treatment an experimental unit is receiving. A single blind experiment is one in which the experimental unit, so the subject, does not know which treatment he or she is receiving. Now, a double blind experiment is one in which neither the experimental unit nor the researcher in contact with the experimental unit knows which treatment the person is receiving. So the English Department of a Community College is considering adopting an online version of the freshman English course to compare the new online course to the traditional course. An English department faculty member randomly splits a section of her course. Half of the students uh, receive the traditional course and the other half receive an online version. And then at the end of the semester, um, both groups are given a test to determine who performed better. So in this case, the experimental units are going to be the students that are in the class. The population to which it applies is going to be all students who, who are enrolling in a freshman English course at this community college. Treatments are the traditional versus the online instruction, so that's what's varying. Response variable is what we actually measure, so we measure their exam score at the end. And then the question is, why can't this experiment be conducted with blinding? Well, both the students and the instructor are going to know which treatment they are receiving. A student knows if they're in an online or a traditional course, and the instructor also knows as well. So there's no way to make this blind, either single blind or double blind. Now, to design an experiment means to describe the overall plan in conducting the experiment. So there are several steps in conducting an experiment. Step one is to identify the problem that it's going to be solved. It should be explicit. It should provide the experimenter with direction. It should identify the response variable and the population. And it's often referred to as the claim. Step two is to determine the factors that affect the response variable. So once the factors are identified, it must be determined which factors are going to be fixed at some predetermined, predetermined level, which is going to be the control, and which factors are going to be manipulated, and which factors are not going to be controlled. Step three is to determine the number of experimental units. So you just have to decide um, how many experimental units you are able to afford, how many you need in order to test the claim that you're interested in. Step four is to determine the level of the predictor variables. So there are two different ways to deal with the factors. Um, control, and within this there are two different ways to control the factors. You can either fix their level at one predetermined value throughout the experiment, and these values or sorry, these are variables whose effect on the response variable is not of interest, or B, you set them at predetermined levels. These are factors whose effect on the response variable does interest us. The combination of levels of these factors represent the treatments in the experiment. Um, you can also randomize. So randomizing the experimental units to various treatment groups um, happens so that the effect of the variable whose level um, cannot be controlled is minimized. So the idea is that randomization sort of averages out the effect of uncontrolled predictor variables. Step five is to actually conduct the experiment. So you randomly assign experimental units to the treatments. Replication occurs when each treatment is applied to more than one experimental unit. And this helps to ensure that the effect of a treatment is not due to some characteristic of a single experimental unit. But, <coughs> excuse me. It is recommended that each treatment group have the same number of experimental units. And then you collect and process the data by measuring the value of the response variable for each replication. And any differences that exist in the value of the response variable is a result of the differences in the level of the treatment. Step six is to test the claim. So this is the subject of inferential statistics. 
Inferential statistics is just a process in which generalizations about a population are made based on the results obtained from a sample. So provide a statement regarding the level of confidence in the generalization. Methods of inferential statistics are presented later in the text. So what we can say is that um, we are a certain percentage confident that um, the true population um, results would be between, I don't know, X and Y, okay? So we're not completely sure that the sample that we took is perfect, okay? It's never going to be perfect. Um, but what we can do is we can use it to kind of obtain a level of confidence and to make some generalizations about our population. Now, a completely randomized design is one in which the experimental unit is randomly assigned to a treatment. So the octane of fuel is a measure of its resistance to detonation with a higher number indicating higher resistance. An engineer wants to know whether the level of octane in gasoline affects the gas mileage of an automobile. And we're going to assist the engineer in designing an experiment. So there are multiple different ways that this could be done, but we're just going to walk through one of the ways. So step one is to identify the response variable. So that's what we're actually measuring. And what we're measuring is miles per gallon. So that's going to be our response. The factors that affect miles per gallon are going to be things like engine size, outside temperature, driving style of the person driving the car, the driving conditions, the characteristics of the car. Okay, there are many, many others. Those are just a few. Step three is to kind of determine um, what we're going to use as the experimental units. So in this case, we're going to use 12 cars. They're all going to be the same model and year of the car, okay? So this kind of helps control for any differences that might exist within cars or between cars. Um, so we're using the same model and year. Um, step four, we're going to list all the variables and their levels. So the octane level is going to be manipulated at three different levels, 87, 89, and 92. The engine size is going to be fixed. The temperature, we can't really control the temperature because we're going to do this outside, but it's going to be the same for all 12 cars because we're going to do this all at the same time of day. Um, driving style and conditions. So one good way to account for this is to have all 12 cars be driven under the same conditions on a closed track. Okay, so it's going to be fixed. So we're going to have basically use the same driver. And then other characteristics of the car, all 12 cars are going to be the same model and year. However, there is still probably variation from car to car. So to account for this, we're randomly assigning cars to the octane level. So step five, we actually randomly assign four cars to the 87, four cars to the 89, and four cars to the 92. We're going to give each car three gallons of gasoline and then drive the cars until they run out of gas and compute the miles per gallon. This is just one way that it could be done. Step six is to determine whether any differences exist in miles per gallon. So here's what our completely randomized design look like looks like, sorry. Um, we take our random assignment of 12 carves, we break it into four, four, and four for our three treatments. We give them 87, 89, and 92, and then we compare the miles per gallon at the end. Now, a matched pairs design is a different type of experimental design, and that's an experimental design in which the experimental units are paired up. Now, the pairs are matched up so that they're somehow related. So, uh, a couple examples of this would be a person's before and after a treatment, um, twins, husband and wife, um, two people who are matched from the same geographical location, and so on. So there are only two levels of treatment in a matched pairs design. So let's look back at the xylitol example. We looked at this earlier, but xylitol has proven effective in preventing dental cavities when included in food or gum. A total of 75 Peruvian children were given milk with and without it and were asked to evaluate the taste. And then the researcher measured the children's ratings of the two types of milk. So the response variable is going to be the rating that, they, that the kids give the milk. Some of the factors in this study um, could be age and gender. My guess is that they have controlled for these, okay? Now, the factor that they're manipulating is the fact that they're giving milk with and without xylitol. So that's our treatment, okay? Milk with xylitol, milk without xylitol. So there are two different treatments. The type of experimental design is going to be matched pairs because one child is giving two different ratings. The experimental units, that's who is actually participating. That's our 75 Peruvian children. 
And then it said, why would it be a good idea to randomly assign whether the child drinks the milk with xylitol first or second? And the reason for that is because we would like to remove any effect that's due to the order in which the milk is drunk. Okay, so if children tend to like the first thing that they drink better or the second thing that they drink better, by randomizing it, we're getting rid of that effect. Now it asks, do you think it would be a good idea to double blind this experiment? Yes. So double blind in this experiment would mean that the child doesn't know if they're drinking the milk with or without xylitol, and the person who's giving them the milk also does not know. So they're not going to affect the child's um, rating at all.